Good morning, everyone. Very excited to welcome you all to our live show this fine morning. It's awfully chilly outside today in New Zealand. I'm here today. I just want to give you a quick rundown of why we're here and uh, what we've got planning for this little live show. So this episode today is going to be running alongside our quarterly webinars. We're going to be holding live shows like this a little bit more often. And our goal here is to get an expert, sales expert, in the studio with us to share their expert in insights on a sales problem. Today we've got Anne Cartwright. He is an NZ-based sales coach and author with over 30 years of experience consulting. And he's going to give us his insights onto a sales problem. In this case, we're looking at growing revenue by focusing on the right things. And we'll begin with a little discussion from Anne. He'll have a little presentation ready for us. And then we'll follow that up with a informal interview slash panel discussion led by Jonathan. After that, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask away in the comments. Um, you can drop your questions at any time in the comment section and we'll get around to answering them. Awesome. Right, with that out of the way, I'd love to hand it over to Ian. Ian, how can we focus our efforts in the right places to drive our sales revenue? Well, good morning, Connie. Firstly, and thanks very much for the introduction and having me on. Uh, yeah, we can, just by keeping things simple. And that's really my mantra is that sales is no real dark art. It's actually just about being organized and disciplined and using the right tools so that you can manage the right activities in the right places. So for those of you who are wondering who on earth I am, I've got 30 years experience in B2B sales. I've been lucky enough to work with sales teams in 20 plus countries, but I don't really see myself as a sales expert. I just started out as an electrical draftsman and then fell into sales through electrical engineering. So what I've learned over the last 30 years is really experiential and I've used it in multiple industries, multiple countries, and it works. And I'm lucky enough now in the last five or so years, I've worked in a consultancy role with clients to teach that method to them and it's helping them do the same thing as well. So these days I focus really with B2B sales professionals and SME owners who are looking to build that sales capability. And I do that by helping them really understand what it is they do for their customers. Everything's about solving a problem. And if we can get people doing that, it sort of removes that fear of sales and helps people have a lot more fun along the way. And one of the key components about that is learning to speak your customer's language. If you can start to learn how to speak the, their language, then you'll understand the problems that they need solved. Solved, And if you can do that for them, then you'll grow your sales anyway. And that just comes down to, to activity. So today we want to really focus on a couple of three things that I think will work really well. I'll give you some a uh, bit of oversight on what that means as far as getting the activity dialed down to the right thing and then measuring it. So my real mantra is that we grow revenue by managing activity, not the results. If we think about a typical sales funnel, we all know that what flows out the end of the funnel is the revenue, the, the dollars. But we can't actually manage that. And that just happens. We get to the end of the month and some of us have sat on these calls where the, the sales leader will say, right, we need another $100,000 today. Where are we going to get it from? Well, it's probably too late because you haven't done the activity. Unless, of course, you're knowing what the right activity is and where to go in the next couple of three days to close those deals that are getting close. So we can't manage results, but we can manage how we get to those targets and KPIs. If we can measure it, we can manage it. So two keys for me around that is really understanding what your sales process is. So a typical funnel, your sales process is the journey your customer goes through series of repeatable steps as they move from being a prospect to a client. These days, we know that our clients are a little bit further down the funnel than they were before in many cases because they've got access to lots of information. But we need to understand what your particular process is. And if you haven't got one, you've got to get one. And then you use a method to move them through. The second part about getting to where we know what the right activity is, is really understanding how sales and marketing works together. Business strategy comes first, then comes the marketing strategy. Sales and marketing have to work together. If we're talking to our customers in their language, then the messaging through marketing needs to reflect that. Any prospect's going to come to your website or your socials, they want to see themselves reflected. So then we need to think about, okay, if I know my numbers and I know what my revenue needs to be and I understand through measurement that I'm getting 50% of my proposals over the line, I know that after 10 interactions with a client, different clients, I'm getting 50% of them to proposal stage, then we can start to work out, okay, I need to be doing X amount of calls, X amount of meetings, X amount of proposals per day. 
in my first sales role in 1994, 93, I knew and my measurement was I needed to make 12 phone calls a day, four meetings. It's still really simple like that. You know, things have changed with social selling and digital selling because we're doing different types of outreach, but we still need to be doing the activity. If we're not doing the activity in the right places with the right people. We're not going to get those results that we want at the end of the funnel to meet those sales targets that we all like. And I was one who's really driven by commission targets, but I learned that if I focused my activity in the right places, those targets take care of themselves. And that's what I'm really on about is making sure that if you understand your numbers and what it takes to get a, a prospect through to here, then you can do the right things in the right places every day. So I distilled that down into how do I make this easy for people who are new into sales to understand how to build a, a process or a method to get themselves really successful at it and learn what they do. So this is what I call the six fundamentals of sales know-how. The first one is actually knowing what you do. It's understanding what your customer achieves through your product and service, how you make their life easier, because it's not actually about your product or service. And my example I give to people is, is about a sandwich. So if I go to Subway today to buy a sandwich, I'm not going there to buy the most attractive looking sandwich that I can find to bring it back and put on my desk and look at it all day. I'm going there because I'm hungry. That's my problem. Now, if I solve my hunger problem, I can be productive for the rest of the day. So understanding what you really do for your customer is really important. And it's about that sales and marketing working together because then we can get our messaging right. If we understand what we do, I then go through to why we do it, which is about purpose and values and traits and human skills won't do that today and then who you do it for is actually being really clear about your target customers who are the people that you most help with your problem solving solution and you get the most value for so you can go and plan the right spaces then i focus on where to do it and that's what i really want to touch on today and give you a couple of three things that you can carry through to work on around that where you do it is actually first with your existing customer base so many clients I've worked with in the last two to three years are really getting excited about, I need to grow my business. Where am I going to go and get a grand, you know, a really bright, shiny piece of new business? Well, the answer for so many is right in front of you. It's about how to maximize the existing returns from your existing client base. And having really good information to be able to measure and manage that is really important. So we'll do a little bit on that very shortly in the next couple of slides. How to do it, that's about a sales method. And I've got a consultative sales methodology, but that's for another day. And the point, the last point, how to do it more is about relationship and key account management. And we'll just touch a little bit on that today. But most important thing, where do you do it? If you're wanting to grow the most revenue right now, it's with your existing customer base. Are you really clear on who they are? And do you know how to maximize that? So let's talk about a couple of wee things that you can do to get the best out of that approach. Knowing where to do it is really like polishing what you've got. Hopefully, you have got some way in which you categorize your customers. So understanding and Pareto principle really applies that typically 80% of your business will come from 20% of your customers. It will take a couple of percent, but it's just so true. So if you can get into it and understand, actually, I know who my platinum customers might be, those one or two on your, which your business really revolves around. And then you've got your gold customers, silver, bronze. You need to come up with some criteria that works for your business to ascertain what means you're a gold customer, what means they're a silver customer. So it might be to do on how much business you're doing with them now, but it might be potential. And ascertaining that categorization category, I recommend that you do it over two to three years of sales results because you're looking for trends. You're looking for customers who have grown in the last two to three years and those that have dived off, you need to know the reasons why. And you're making sure by doing this that you're actually following the money and not chasing unicorns. It's a phrase a customer reflected back to me because he was spending a whole lot of time on people who ended up being bronze categories because he thought they might be good, but he hadn't been through the process to work it out. So then if we've got a really clear understanding of where our goal customers are, then we can actually program objective activity to make sure that we are in front of them or reaching out to them the right time, number of times in the right places regularly. And being able to find a way that you can actually gather that information and share it within your team is really important because that means that across a team, you can start re replicating good practice, what works. All right. So we're making sure that you are clear on who your top customers are and that you are really loving them. A secondary part of that actually too is if you've got a silver customer, well, a silver customer has got potential to grow to gold. So have you got plans in place to make that happen? So from there, you can start to put together a key account plan based on what activity needs to happen in the right places for you to do that. 
And if you want to jump onto my website, iancartwright.co.nz, in the resources section, you'll find a blank key account plan there that you can download and start playing with yourself. So remember, really focusing on our existing customer base. So once we've got clear who they are and how we're looking after them and loving them, one of the other things we can do is actually identify some white spaces where we can get some more business from them. But we'll come to that in a couple of slides. So part of really understanding those existing customers is knowing who's who in the zoo which is a no surprises philosophy. So that's about making sure that you know who all the decision makers are, particularly in your gold customers, because you don't want to be surprised, but it's certainly down to the silver as well. And you can do that with just putting a contact matrix together. So we've got an example here. This would be for a typical, well, this is it from a client I worked with before. It was an aggregate company. So this is their customer here, and it lists all the, the, tip, the important people they should have their relationships with. And across here, we can map out your organization. So the general manager, the sales engineer and someone on the admin side. And then we need to map out who needs to know who and understand who the decision makers and who the influencers are. Again, if you want to jump to the resources section on my website, there is a blank PDF where you can fill one of these out for yourself. But this is really important because what we don't want is any surprises. You know, we learn from our mistakes and we've all, and I've done it lots of times, but not so much now, had a situation where you miss out on securing a deal because our oh, actually my boss decided that we weren't going to go with you and you didn't have the introduction or the meeting with the boss because you hadn't mapped out who was who. So if you get to the point where you've identified someone else you need to be talking to, and that's as simple as saying, look, this deal that we're trying to get over the line, who else do I need to be talking to about it? So you might be dealing with a quarry manager, but you don't know the area oper operations manager. That's as simple as saying, look, I really love to meet the person here that I'm dealing with. I've got to build a bridge to this person as well, making sure that you've got those relationships built. So layered relationships. So being able to manage the right activity in the right places, you've got to identify who you're doing it with. So I talked a little bit before about white spaces. We've got your key customers sorted out. We know who your gold and silver customers are, but are you getting all of their business? Really simple exercise to identify low hanging fruit here is just to identify those white spaces. So again, take this out of the resources section and just write down who your top 10 customers are. Now you may have five, six multiple products that you're dealing with or you're taking to market, but you might be able to map out and say, actually for my top customer, they're only dealing with four of my six products and I know they're using the other two from someone else. So I need to put a plan in place to see actually what I need to do to secure that business. And then work out how you're going to convert it. The more you can polish your existing customer base, it's so much easier. You have existing relationships anyway, but if you can really nurture those existing customers, make sure that you're maximizing the amount of problems you're solving for them. You do that, you'll get the revenue. Then you get to, to develop really low cost, simple case studies that you can share as anecdotes with other customers that you're talking to. You earn referrals. You can ask those customers, well, you know, we've been doing some great business together. Who else do you think I should talk to? That sort of discussion is really easy with someone you've got a really good relationship with and they become advocates. And my last little saying around um, knowing where to do it is grow mold. Mold grows in spores right next to each other. So does really good sales. So if you've got an existing customer who might be doing some business in an area really similar to where you'd like to grow the next piece of business, just replicate that. I've got a client I've been working with, and it's a great example of this. He supplies masonry uh, equipment and tools to the construction industry. And some of his best customers are bricklayers those bricklayers conduct work for group home builders. Now he worked out really early on that some of those group home builders have three bricklayers working for them. And with some of them, he only had the business of one or two of the bricklayers. So he then put a plan in place to secure the business of the third bricklayer. So he was growing new business right next to existing, which is the same as what he was already doing for them. So it was an easy conversion. All right. They're really important to maximize the business you're getting from your existing customers. And it's really simple. It's just about putting plans in place and having the data to do so. So a bit of a, a mini, mini seminar there, but my big summary around that is just you've got to manage those results. You can do that by having the right activity program in the right places at the right time, making sure that you are solving pro customers' problems, but solve those problems in your customer's language. And all of that is in my book. So hopefully there's some little tips that you can take, jump on the website of mine, grab those resources, start populating out, but actually really, really focus on what you've got and do the right stuff in the right places at the right time. Yeah, it's excellent. Um, 
Ian, thank you very much for going through that. I was, I was interested in your point about the um, the customer's language and that aspect, which I think is, is really good. You know, if I'm a rep out there today and I'm sort of trying to go through that process and sort of think about my, the language my customers use, um, how, how, would, how would I actually start doing that? What would I, you know, write a list of things that they would typically say? Or what would be the process you would coach a rep on to actually make a start on that today? It's a little bit of research to understand first off what their business is and what their typical challenges are. And if you can get with your customer and walk around, you might be in a retail situation, you've got a store and this is the buyer, you can walk around with them and say, look, I understand that you are, you know, you've got, what's, what are your products that are, that are selling most at the moment? And just get them talking and it's being inquisitive. So there's a whole process around that. But the more you can start to ask curious, insightful questions of your customer, you're showing empathy and a genuine interest they will respond to that and you've got to be smart and ask the right questions but you didn't start to build a rapport and building a rapport is the first step towards building trust so you've got to do a little bit of research first to actually know about what your products do generally to help them but then you have to get specific about their their particular instance or situation so asking them what's going on in their world what's causing the most problem and then okay well that it's a problem for you what does that mean to you think about it a bit further down the line most customers are interested in two things productivity profitability so putting your questions in that context in their world in their language and trying to quantify what the issue really is and then trying to map out what that means in terms of issues for them in terms of production or cost in terms of profitability then you can start to talk about okay well actually our product here will enable you to save two hours off this process what's that going to mean to you if we can do that so Asking those questions in your customer language, best way to build rapport, particularly when you're new and you're green and you don't know everything. There's nothing wrong with saying that. And you say to your customer, look, I'm just new to this role. I'd love to learn more about what you do. Can you explain to me what that machine does? And then just start being really curious and insightful and genuine. Yeah, that's excellent. And would that be something you would role play, you know, from a sales manager and a rep standpoint? Um, for, you know, new, new salespeople coming into a role, actually role playing it with them and getting them into that? Um, way of doing it? Absolutely. Really hard for sales managers these days because there's a lot to do, lots of reporting, although there are some tools out there to make it easier. Jonathan, I'm sure you can tell us about one or two of those. But <laughs> the job of a sales manager is also to coach. And those coaching opportunities, they can be done side by side. If a sales manager is riding shotgun with a sales rep and they're going to see customers together, once you've been through the meeting, after the meeting, you can do a bit of review. You know, what happened there? What do you think went well? What do you think you could improve on? And then that's when those coaching opportunities um, raise their head but you can't do sales training once a quarter you can't do it once every six months it's got to be ongoing it's that's where businesses like sport you know scott robertson didn't say to the crusaders at the start of the season this is what we're going to do for the season here's some coaching leave you to it and i'll see you at the final it's every day if you can but at least every week because it's how you grow you grow your team and for sales managers if they can grow their team through good coaching it makes everybody's lives easier yeah, that's good. Have you seen the sort of best ways, you know, practically of sales managers doing that? Because we all get it that the coaching aspect is massive, but making time to do it, you know, the, the rhythm of doing it. How have you sort of seen the best teams to kind of do that sort of in, in coaching as they go through their, you know, their month and, and so on? you got to program it in and think about when the best time to do it is. So Friday afternoons, not many customers want to see you. So that's a good time to be doing coaching and working on your organization discipline and then planning out what your calls are for the next week. So it's about actually taking two points of this though with coaching. There's a lot of focus on analyzing losses. You know, we lost this because of what and what could we have done better? That's really important. Equally, you need to look at why you're winning. So we've actually won this big deal. What did we do really well there? Because you've got to learn out of that. So, and that's like when I work with customers and we're trying to get the sales and marketing working together and we're well, what are the marketing messages? What is it we really do for our customers? Go and ask them, find out why they like what you do for them and you know what it is that really makes things sing. So coaching is about making sure you're making the time to do it, that it is part of what you do and it's personal development, but it's really focusing on what we do well and what we can improve from. So it's that, there's an old Johnny Mercer song and it's about accentuating the positive. So you need to do that, but you have to be real as well. So make time for it. Same with anything. Same with this activity that you're trying to do with your customers. Make time for it and make it happen. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, so if I was thinking about sort of today's presentation and, you know, I'm reporting back, say, hey, what was today about? What, what are the sort of three key takeaways from a sales rep's perspective that you would want people to do after listening to um, what today's been about? Yeah. So the first one sort of goes together. It's understanding what you do for your customers and who they are. So really understanding your customer base and where your money comes from. Focusing on solving problems for them, which means you have to learn their language and actually what their world is. And when you do that, you learn a lot more and have more fun anyway. And then it's about just doing the work, getting the activity program so that you're doing the right activity with the right people in the right places so that you'll realize those targets and you'll help a lot of people along the way. Yeah, it's good. And would you have an example of, you know, where something's, you know, the process that you've, you've talked about, you like your six steps, which um, I liked in that terms of your, your process there. We'd have an example of something that you'd want to talk through in terms of where that's, you know, worked really well for you know, either, either a sales manager or a sales rep and just tell us quickly about that. I think probably um, me in a way where this all gel for me was uh, around about the 2000s and I was working for a motor control business and we looked, I was the regional manager for the South Island and we put this plan in place and we grew our revenue by 300% in three years by simply mapping out by region in the South Island and then by industry segment, who our customers were and then what it was we did for them, uh, being really clear about what the buying channels were. So we're knowing who was who in the zoo and then just doing the stuff every day, whatever the activities needed to be. For some customers, it was an in-house, um, you know, sausage rolls and beers at the end of the day. For other people, it was seminars with consultants. So it was about making sure we were doing the right stuff for the right people. And it takes time. And underneath that, you've got to have a good sales methodology where you're learning how to ask those questions and uncover needs so you can then offer a proposal which adds value and then you can, we well, don't close it, but your customer asks to buy. So that worked, that's where I learned a lot of this and it worked really well for me. And it was in different areas and I was working with different people. And that's what I've taught people uh, and customers we deal with now. So uh, I've got like a, even a diesel mechanic that I'm working with. He understands that he's got trade customers and he's got cash buying customers. He markets to them in different ways and understands that he gets a lot of referral work from really making things sing for his trade customers because of the problems he solves for them. So it's not a dark art. It's actually just about breaking it down into bite-sized chunks and doing those things every day, and the results will take care of themselves. But you can't manage a sales result, but you can manage the activity to get there. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and great, great insights into that. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking also about, you know, actually rec um, recording the, the activity is something we've, from a numeric perspective, put a lot of effort into in the last um, year or so, is actually being able to record that activity in the moment. Because what we found time and time again is that, you know, you've done a sales call, you've you've gathered some information, and then, like, you know, you're thinking, right, oh, that's right, I've got to go and update the system, put all this information to it. I can't, can't, can't be bothered with that. I'm on, on to my new, next one, on to my next call. And I get to the end of the day and I've got all this kind of ad, this burden of admin overhead that I've got to go go through and do, which is a real a, a challenge. So we've sort of probably been putting a lot of effort into go, how could we create um, an experience that was unquestionably the fastest in the world to actually get that information into the system and then do that in a really engaging way. And for those that saw our um, webinar um, a few weeks ago around the whole idea of doing a post, you know, we found that reps will happily put something on a group chat, you know, be it a WhatsApp chat or something like that to say, hey, I had a great win here. We've sort of taken exactly that concept and made that around posts. So you can post something instantly. They're engaging. It's interesting to look at. And then it captures that key point that you mentioned around the activity type. Once you've got the activity type, you can start reporting on that and you can say, are we doing the right types of activity? Are we doing the right number of them? so on and so forth. So that's sort of been a big, you know, focus just le leveraging on from what you were saying before. Yeah, and what I heard, of, I have had a look at the app and what I really like about it is the ability to drill down into your, you know, your, the results you're getting from customers by product line, by year. So you actually don't lose focus of where you should be working. You've got really clear transparency of the types of customers you should be working with. But that point you've just raised there about taking just a snapshot and a few words about what you've done at a particular customer that's really worked and then been able to share that instantaneously across the team where they can all learn together and build that really team inclusive culture i think it's fantastic it's a great tool yeah that, i mean just to show that as, as an example you know that's really that sort of concept there where we're creating a really engaging um little post 
So you can see a post that's been created. It's got a photo. It's got a video in it. That's you know highly engaging from a rep's um, perspective, and actually really useful. You know, it's not it's not admin for the sake of admin. It's a task that hang on, I've actually got to get something done. So that's sort of been a, a big driver um, from a numeric standpoint. And then just covering off on that other point that you that you raised around um, the white spaces. Obviously, that's a, a big part of what numeric's about as well. Is where you know, you've got you, you got your, your, your customer, your targets. You drill down into the target. You drill down to say your reps. You look at a particular rep. You're drilling down then to their customers and seeing what's happening at that customer level. And then you're going from the customer down into the product group or product categories, which gives you that kind of um, you know that share of wallet view where you're starting to see those white spaces appear, the product groups and categories that are behind. So, yeah, it's just really supporting what what you say. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, guys. Well, we've got a few minutes left. But just before we end, I've got a little question here from James. I'm going to show it on our screen. So he's just asking, you know, in the sales funnel, you mentioned, Ian, that um, customers are being f further along in that funnel these days. And in your opinion, is it better to give them more info online and let them advance themselves or get them to contact you to get that info but control the process better? You could just give your thoughts on that. That's a good question, James. It's a bit of a balance, actually, because we all get frustrated, don't we? If we want to go and get some information and we have to log in and give an email address. So I wouldn't encourage that um, scenario. It's actually part of your activity is, is the marketing piece. And, and look, let's be honest, we're doing that at the moment, aren't we? We're trying to give information that actually encourages people to go a little bit further, whether it be with me or numeric. So give genuine information out there by adding value that people can leverage. But at some point, they're going to want their hand held to get over the line because there's just some stuff they don't understand. So uh, I would try and make it easy to give people information, but also every time you give information, have a call to action out there to remind them there that you are there to help, that if there's something they don't understand, that they can get in touch with you. So make yourself, uh, I won't go too far into deep in this, but I covered it in my book where we used to do the four P's of marketing. I prefer save, which is uh, solution, uh, access, value, and education. So it's about making yourself accessible rather than promoting different slant on a wee bit and you're educating them rather than pushing too much stuff at them so if you've got content out there which is adding value but it, you're making yourself really accessible the right things will happen i hope that helps that's brilliant awesome answer there Ian. all righty well i think that's everything that we wanted to touch on today and we don't want to hold you guys the wonderful audience up because we all know you need to get on with it, get selling, get things happening. Um, other than that, our next little webinar is going to be on the 12th of July, and they'll be with Liz Hyman. And keep an eye out on Ian's site and uh, the numeric site for any content that we make post-stream and on LinkedIn, and a recording of this will be made available um, to all our guests. All right, awesome. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. Um, bye from me, Jonathan and Ian. We'll catch you in the next one. Catch Thank you very much, Johnny. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.